Hi, good afternoon, home language and first additional language. Um, this is actually week 10's um, video recording, canned recording, because it's visual, visual literacy and you need this information for your assignment three. So I'm actually going to do it this afternoon. And then in week 10, I'm going to reverse and come and do film study. A lot of film studies actually based on visual literacy, the shots, the angles, how we interpret the pictures. So this is actually quite important that you see cartoons, you see advertisements, so that you are able to discuss the genre elements when you look at the visual literacy part of assignment three. Okay, so I'm just going to share my screen with you quickly and get that PowerPoint up and running. Yes, it's the 15th of May. A lot of you will be submitting your, I think it's your week eight um, submissions or is it week seven? I'm not even sure anymore. I'll have a look when I get to that spreadsheet. Um, and um, some of you will also be submitting SOAs for assignment two. So lots of things happening tonight. Don't leave it too late. Right, so um, yes, visual literacy is the topic. This is the next part of reading. It's all about understanding what you see. So do you really understand and can you unpack visual elements in any picture, image, sign, symbol, and so on? But you need to understand it. The same as you read something and understand it and comprehend it, the same as you've got to understand body language, visual images, angles, wide angles, um, close-ups, focus, those things also give an understanding of what you're looking at. So you have your books, which you read, but you also have all these images that come out, which are so exciting and you need to understand and describe and discuss. Okay, so how are you coping? I asked you that. I see some of you went back and you actually added to the main T, so I'm glad about that. I think for um, THF, um, there were 14 of you this time, and for TFF, I think there's about 11 of you. It's still up and running, so if you'd like to go and check it out, you can still do that. I think the biggest word for TFF is that you are overwhelmed. Okay, too many dates, too many due dates. I'm trying to cope, but I'm stressed. I'm unprepared for um, real teaching. That's what really happens in the classroom. Um, you probably will be prepared, but um, that's when you get into the classroom. That's when it all comes together. For THFS, um, yes, stress seems to be the biggest word. So how are you coping means a lot of you are feeling overwhelmed, stressed, anxious, um, drained. Um, but there are some of you that are pushing through, saying you're trying, could be better. Um, I'm excited. I like that. And another one said exciting. Uh, so maybe there's a little bit of balance. So just keep on trying to cope. Yes, it's always darkest before the dawn. So just keep on working hard and just plugging on. That's all you can really do. Okay. So don't give in. Let's just keep hanging in. Okay. And I've got something else for you. How often do you? So this is more a bit of in research for me, another Mentimeter. And I've put this in week 10. You can go and click on that and you can rate yourself on the following scale. So it looks something like that. Um, I read announcements. Um, so I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to actually go to um, the Mentimeter and I'm going to share that with you so you know what to do. Um, let me go to values. I can find it. How often do you? Um, there we go. I hope you can all see it. So it's going to look something like this on Mentimeter. And I read announcements on um, Canvas. And if you pull this little ball along here, it says never is one when oh, I start moving. But if you get it to the middle, um, you'll see the little, oh, there. Two is seldom, pull it along. Three is sometimes, four is often, and five would be always. So there's five questions. I read announcements, right? So this is anonymous, so please be truthful. Um, I watch learning event recordings, okay, from never to always. I refer to the lesson PowerPoints from never to always. I join Zoom learning events. Please be truthful. And how many of you do that? Um, I access the course details on Canvas. I know what's going on on Canvas. So rate yourselves on that. So I'm going to stop the share and I'm going to go back and I'm going to share my PowerPoint with you again. Um, there you go. Hope we're back online again. So 
going to get the multimeter, mentimeter. Um, this is a bit of research for me. I want to see how often you do these and I will give you a reading on that. So it's very easy. Just drag the little ball and rate yourself on a scale of one to five. Okay, how often you do this. Okay, let's go on to the next one. Yes, we're looking at home language again, the spreadsheet, the never ending spreadsheet. You are still 93 and 122 for home language. Um, as you can see, quiz seven, um, oh, that's the one that's going to be submitted tonight, the 15th. This has gone up slightly, so 23 um, of FET have submitted and 29 of SP and four and four of quiz eight. Um, so some of you are getting to that. The quiz eight is only due next Sunday, so you've got time to do that. Um, remember, there's nothing for the forum. So thanks for doing that. Um, yes, assignments one and two are in now. Um, we are busy marking assignment one. We're hoping to finish this by early this week, getting it to the internal moderators, and then we can release. I'm hoping to release at least some of them by Friday, and then we can start assignment two. This gives us two weeks to complete assignment two before assignment three gets in. So it's been a bit crazy because markers have not been able to access Canvas before last weekend, so they're busy marking. Okay, so we're all trying, and I hope you're all trying. Um, I've also, today, I saw that I hadn't published the actual link for assignment three, but all the information is on Canvas. It has been on Canvas um, with the worksheet, uh, with the actual assignment. It's also been in the assessment guide, so the information has been available to you. And more than likely, we'll be putting an assignment three overview for the, those of you who are starting to ask questions. Um, I think it helped a bit with assignment um, Two. So let's just we put that together and see if that helps some of those of you who are not too sure on how to go about your PowerPoint um, for your genre-based assignments. Okay, so not sad. Um, we're getting there. We're moving on. For first additional language, yes, you're also 92 and 179 SPs. Also the assignment 7, um, 10 and 25, quite low the figures there. Um, of course, no um, discussion forums. Um, they are due tonight, so I'm sure when I look at this tomorrow, there'll be many of you that will have submitted um, on online tracking number seven, and on the 22nd, uh, that is for the poetry and drama, okay, for that, for the, for the two and the six there for SPs and FETs. Okay, so well done. There's your assignments. As I said, same thing for first language. Um, we, we are busy marking. I've marked all the high similarities from 50 to 100%. My markers are busy marking the rest of them. And um, some very good, yes, very good assignment ones as well coming through. Um, and we learn a lot through what the feedback we give you on those assignments. So we don't feel too distressed and upset at this moment. Okay, just our deadlines. Um, as I said tonight, it's going to be the, oh, it's a short story and novel that's been submitted tonight. Um, the 22nd is going to be week eight, your poetry and your drama. 29th is going to be film study. Um, and 6th of June visual literacy, but we're going to swap these around, remember, because I'm, I'm changing the order. So visual literacy will be the 29th and film study will be the 6th of June, followed by assignment three on the 29th of May and the 6th, I think it's the 5th of June, is going to be assignment four. Yes, so as due dates are coming in, please watch your calendars and get that time management going all the time. Okay. Right, so unit three, we, we getting towards the end. We've done the theories of reading, chapter 10. We've looked at short story, novel, drama, and poetry. That's Pereira, chapter 12. And um, we start in visual literacy this afternoon, 15th of May. Um, it's now half past three, or no, actually it's nearly four o'clock. And we're gonna not start at the full study. We're gonna start, in fact, with week 10, cartoons, adverts, and pictures, and so on. And um, that's all from Pereira, chapter 14. You can get all the information there. And we're going to swap week nine and week 10 around. Yes, we're going to get our visual thinking toolkit equipped and jam-packed tonight after this learning event lecture. And then we're going to finish off with looking at a few resources. And finally, the finale is going to be um, best language teaching practices to finish off the semester. OK, so. <coughs> I, as I said, I am going to give you an overview of um, assignment three, the genre-based workshop. I want to try and give you an outline of what I'd like in each of the slides and speak a bit about the techniques of putting the PowerPoint together. So I'm going to try and get that up and running by tomorrow. 
THF and TFF or the FETs, you're going to look at the genre elements to teach a short story and a cartoon. Okay. Uh, this is saying uh, the genre elements of a poem that won't be, that would be for SPs, whereas you're going to do the cartoon and the short story. They got a bit mixed up. And for the SPs, you're going to look at the poem, <laughs> yes, and you look at the advertisement. So that should be changed there. That should be the short story for FETs. And it's the cartoon sharing a same theme. And there's all the themes you can look at from perseverance to honesty to courage to health. Um, and here was the other um, image that came across with it from power to health and so on. So all these are themes that you could consider for your short story, your poem, your, your visuals, like your cartoon and your advertisement. Right, so let's, let's get an outline of what we're going to look at tonight. We can look at the CAPS document of what they say about teaching visual literacy. What is the value of visual literacy? Why do we need to worry about visual literacy? We're going to look at a different analysis of different terms, the genre elements we're going to use within visual literacy. We look at the different text types. We can look at symbols. We're going to look at photograph pictures and images, different advertisements and how we analyze them, cartoons as well. And then we're going to look at how we actively go about viewing visuals. These are the genre elements that you have to discuss when you prepare your workshop. How do you discuss a short story? How do you discuss a poem? How do you discuss a cartoon? How do you analyze a cartoon? How do you analyze an advertisement? And those are the elements you need to focus on when you're discussing these genres. All right, so Cap says, um, this comes in reading and viewing, the outcome too. You've got to understand visual texts. You've got to be able to evaluate them critically. And you've got to be able to respond to ver all various kinds of texts that are visual. Um, what is visual literacy? It's making meaning of the visual text the same way as you have to make meaning of a written text. So if you see a picture, you've got to be able to interpret it and unpack it. Um, so if you're visually literate, and some people don't see pictures, so they can't see facial expressions, they can't read the detail of the picture, um, this means you've got to study pictures to be able to become visually literate so you can understand what you've seen, you can interpret it what the photographer or the person who's illustrating wants to show you, and you can evaluate and assess what this visual message is all about. There's a cartoon, there's three frames, and that the language is that you need to know that cartoons come in frames. And if you have a look at it, you've got to be able to interpret that these two um, kids are playing on their cell phones. That's why you see the tick, 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 tick. Okay, so that's the visual message. The granny's not too happy, and she says, the trouble with you kids is that you don't really know what's going on because you always have your nose in your phones. And you also know that the, the bold is meaning that she's shouting them and the use of the exclam exclamation mark here also shows that she's shouting. Okay, they are totally focused. If you look at the eyes, they're big and they're staring. They're looking down at their screens. Second, second frame. Hey, when did we go outside? And she says, we're outside. Still tick, 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 tick. Um, he's noticed it outside, she's pushed them out the house, they don't even realize, they're oblivious to the fact that they're outside. And in the final frame, you see then she shuts the door, they are outside, she slammed the door, the, the bold lettering, the exclamation mark, and they're not perturbed, their faces are in their screens, and they're quite happy to go on tick, 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 tick. Nothing has changed in the world, and this is quite a lot of humor coming to that our students, our learners, our kids are totally fixated on their screens, and they've will can change, can fall apart, and they won't move their eyes from those screens. Right, so in paper one, um, this is for um, FETs, 20 of your 70 marks um, for um, home language are going to be about visual literacy. It's about the same for, S, uh, for um, first additional language. It's about 80 marks of paper one, and then I think about 20, 15 to 20 are all about visual literacy. Paper two, this is for the SPs, 15 of your marks could possibly be about um, visual literacy, and that's in your language in context part of your paper. Okay, so it's quite a high percentage and visual literacy comes into all the creation of these language papers. So why is nonverbal code so important? Okay, because what makes an imp impression, and I've spoken to this about before, 
what makes an impression on people is the nonverbal. If you look over this, 55% of your body movements, your nonverbal language, your face, your arms, your gestures make an impression on people. So that's very visual. 7% of your words, which is very little of what you actually say, makes an impression. And 38% of how you speak, your voice, your tone, your modulation, your pauses, people remember. So your voice, the verbal aspect of that, along with your body language and how you're using gestures and voice projection make the impression. So nonverbal is very important for communication. So just remember that we are surrounded by visual literacy. Every look, even if you look at the picture of me on the screen there, we're surrounded by visual literacy. From facial expressions to our gestures, our use of hands, maps, Google Maps, road signs you see on the road, symbols, the Apple sign, films, television, posters, billboards, cartoons, product packaging, graphs, you just name it, it's out there. Um, he has another cartoon. There is the visual image, but what is she doing? She's looking at the visual through her phone. Um, we've got to interpret there, looking at the beautiful elves' appearance, father's gasp of what beautiful it is. But she's saying, look, here's another scenic area. I'm not even worried about what she's seeing in reality, but focusing on her screen. And how do we interpret this when we're trying to find out what the humor is in this picture? You can see the shock on her mom's face. We'll have to go and interpret those faces to see how they're all feeling. Yes, pictures, images, yes, this beautiful sleek line car. I mean, it makes us want to buy that vehicle, the, the gorgeous vehicle. What about signs? Like, what does that mean? Do you understand it? Are you able to understand that that means it's the, the men's and the ladies place where you go to the, the, the bathroom? So to be able to understand the visual, to understand packaging, yes, Smarties, okay? Um, those lovely, yummy Smarties that we pop in our mouths. Um, that packaging entices us to buy it and there it is smarties with all the color so there are various non-verbal codes that you need to understand and if you're going to interpret any kind of visual picture or cartoon you've got to know what these codes are um there are about five that we can look at on this page um the first one is proxemics that means how close are we to the to the person in the picture so if we are far social distancing it shows it's not a very good relationship between us. So this proxemics, how close are you to that person? Is it in the intimate space, you're right against them, or is it in more of the public space, you're very far from them? What about your clothing and personal adornment? Okay, this shows your group membership. Um, if you're a young teenager, you want to look just like your friends, you want to wear the same cut of shorts, you want to wear your, your, your jeans with holes in, you want to wear sneakers. You want to look like your friends um, right down to what masks you wear. So because it shows that I'm a member of a group, why, why in sports do we wear the sports outfits as we do? Gaze is our eye contact to show attention or no attention. Some, some cultures, it's not good to make eye contact because it shows that you're disrespectful. In my culture, it's important that you make eye contact because it shows that you're really listening and you're respecting someone. So there can be a bit of a clash there if you think about things like gaze, if you think about proxemics, I might not like somebody to come very close to me in my culture, but in your culture, you might show more respect by coming very close to people. Your facial expression. Um, and you have that universal facial expressions. It, it doesn't matter what culture you are, you'll understand what a smile is, a frown is, an angry face, a shocked face, a surprised face. It's a universal language that's actually going to show that they will be able to interpret that you're happy or you're not happy. Kinesics is your body, how your neck is in relation to your arm, is in relation to your legs, are your legs crossed, are your arms folded, are you using your hands, are you putting your finger on your lips, are you moving your head to the side. Um, this shows interest or lack of interest. If I'm leaning back, it shows I'm not interested. If I'm leaning forward, it shows I am interested. How does my hand gestures, what does that mean? How does the temple sign mean? Um, the, the thumbs up and so on. How do these things convey? interest or lack of interest. And also our voice is our vocalics, um, a soft voice, a loud voice, a critical voice, um, a terse voice. Um, how does this show what we're trying to convey? And often our voice will show things like sincerity, respect, trust, compassion, and anger, yes. This is your proxemics, a different, different zones from the intimate to the personal, to the social, to the public. The intimate zone is where the person's right up against you. They can only see part of your body because they're so close. They can smell your breath and they can 
feel the body heat and we only like some people from different cultures let it be somebody that's very close to us our family or our partner um, but we wouldn't like someone that we don't know to comes right into our personal space and um, that's more for the public space if you live in a town you might have no personal you might not have personal space you don't mind everybody being on top of you but if you come from a more rural area you might enjoy rather having people a meter away from you with social distancing people have to get used to being a meter and a meter and a half, meter and a half away from everybody else your adornment, what you wear, put you into your group, into your culture. It might be your hijab, your abaya. It could be um, your kaftan. It could be your jeans. It shows you which culture you are and where you belong. Um, what about gaze and eye contact? If you look at the person running the meeting here, everyone's looking at her. They're making eye contact. They're showing they're interested. The lady in the front is looking at the guy speaking. She's, all eye contact shows that you're taking note of what is happening. Our hand gestures, this is like the open hand gesture. She, they're looking at each other. She's even leaning slightly forward, shows that they are interested. So you must be able to unpack these pictures and explain what you are seeing. Um, she's got a very kind face. She's got a very interesting face. She's got a slight smile. So that shows she's quite happy and her attitude is very positive. Um, if you look at this one, they're all sitting separately. So you, should, you can see that they're not a family group. They may be all in the social space. They're not really in the intimate space. Their, their body language in terms of their, their kinesics. You can see the guy in the middle who's got his hand up by his mouth, shows that he's quite nervous. Those with their hands folded and in their laps show that they're quite stressed. The lady on, the, on my left shows that she's sitting with her legs together. She's looking straight ahead. She's very focused and her hands are in a very positive sign there. She's not touching at a paper. So these things also speak volumes as does our voice when we punctuate everything and say you are late again all right and we get that vicious look on our faces our eyes bulge we can see the person is cross they're clenching their teeth how do you interpret that what do you look at how do you discuss it are you going to speak about gesture are you going to speak about kinesics are you going to speak about vocalics um, these are things how you discuss body and nonverbal language okay are you lying let's say if you look to the left um, you are telling the truth, you look to the right, you are lying because the, the lying part is the greater side of our brain, whereas the left is our logical, where we would tell the truth, okay? So, but how do you show you lying? And often we will we'll touch our hair, we'll touch our mouth because our body le leaks this information that we are telling a lie. Okay, so how are you feeling today? Okay, look at those faces. Um, can you interpret them why that's a silly face and why that's a confused face and why that's an angry face? And why that's a sad face. Can you say the person's got a frown, his mouth is turned down, his eyes are glaring. Um, the silly face is pulling a tongue and winking um, to be able to interpret what you're actually seeing and discuss why you're saying it's a sad or happy or silly or angry face. So if you're feeling cool, why is that person with the glasses cool? Explain it, play, explain it in terms of visually. Why is this person sick? Okay, they've got the mask on, their eyes look like they are slits. Um, why is this person tired? Yes, the Z sleeping sign, the eyes are closed, the mouth looks like it's snoring. Why are you happy? To explain these faces, we've got the one for embarrassed, goofy, surprised, um, annoyed. You must be able to explain those facial expressions. Okay, so CAPS also values visual literacy. Um, and according to CAPS, this is to integrate and enrich our classrooms. So you've got to bring the visual in and extend every learning area to bring something in with some kind of visual relation and focus. And this will require interpretive skills such as analyzing the body language, as I said, the facial expression, the gestures to analyze it and to be able to talk about it. Um, what is this lady doing? Um, asking to find pictures of different facial expressions. She's doing that to her mouth. She's looking to the side. What does that indicate when you do that? I think it means that she's not very sure of something. She's thinking about something. Then you've got to evaluate this face. Why has this happened? What context is it? She seems to have a big purple jersey on. Um, what about the language that's been used? And these are the different forms of language. It could be emotive language, remember the shouting. It could be a fact, 100%, or an opinion I don't like, I like. Irony, opposite. Um, that you say I'm late, but you, you're not really late, you're sitting and you're smiling. You predict the outcome. So from this, what is going to happen? 
And this causes the students to think more laterally, and that means creative. So to use pictures, get your students to get different pictures of different things and let them discuss it and say why. Let them explain the whole body language. Let them look at the words. Let them predict the outcomes um, so they can get used to the richness of visual pictures and images. Let them look at different cartoons. Let them look at the frames, the wording, um, the use of bold, use of exclamation marks, the use of frames. Um, looking at gaze, looking at proxemics, um, how is this all put together? And here we've got Garfield and you hear in the background going tap, 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 bang. Oh, my thumb, okay. Same thing in the second um, frame, tap, 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 bam. Oh, my thumb. And then he comes inside and he says, in the third thing, I've decided not to hang that picture. So now you know what he was trying to tap the picture onto the wall, putting a little nail in the wall. And Garfield says very ironically, I hope you run out of thumbs, okay? Because obviously he's whacking his thumb each time. And if you look at the facial expressions, you look at his eyes, um, you have to be able to interpret those as well. So this is the value of visual literacy still, um, because you can discuss all kinds of topics looking at a visual image, like things like drug addiction, tolerance, social distancing, abuse. Um, Use of screens in the classroom, not paying attention because you're too busy on your screens. I don't think in our classrooms you bring pictures, you don't bring your um, phones in, but maybe you in higher education, you do have your phones in front of you all the time. Things like um, closed circuit television, um, you're under surveillance, let's talk about that. Well, our security, our privacy, let's speak about things like that, looking at things like cameras. What about seatbelts? Do you wear your seatbelts? Um, buckle up every time, let's talk about that issue. What about smoking? Okay, drug taking, those are things that you can speak about using visuals. Um, this helps students to broaden their outlooks. They can argue, they can adopt a different point of view. Um, you can get them to debate it. Why is it good to smoke? Why is it bad to smoke? Look at all different kinds of current topics. And that could be the wearing of masks. Do we really have to wear masks? Should we wear masks? What about what masks? What do you like about them? What don't you like about them? What about vaccinations? Have you been vaccinated? Um, should we be vaccinated? Um, my, my nieces and nephews are very, very from age six to 14 in the United States, all have been vaccinated, don't wear masks to school um, because they all have been vaccinated. So should we be vaccinated? Talk about this, take very topics about it. What about the floods in KZN? This picture shows what actually happened. Why is this climate change is occurring? What was the effect of the floods on people? Um, are you still suffering? What was good about the floods? Okay, so you, you can talk about all kinds of issues relating to the visual part of things. You cannot teach without a visual aspect coming in. So these are different terms you need to apply to analyze the visual. You can't just talk about the picture without having the terms. So you're going to be able to look at, talk about facial expressions. So if I'm going to analyze the visual, I need to think about facial expressions, happy, sad, surprised, shocked, angry, the body language, the gaze, the kinesics, the proxemics, I need to be able to look at that. Relationships, are they close or distant or friendly or strained? And how do I interpret this? It might be from the proxemics and it might be by the, the gaze and it could be about the facial expressions. The setting, where did this take place? What time, where was it? Yeah, what about the composition of the picture? What about the center? What was the focus of the picture? What is the foreground of the picture? What is the background of the picture? If you look at this, in the foreground, you see this little girl's face. Um, in the, sorry, in the foreground, you see her face. In the center, you see this fire. In the background, you see the smoke and what's going on. So it moves you. Why is she actually smiling when the house is burning down? So there might be a little contradiction there, but this moves you through the picture. What about the color, the shading, the black, the white, to look at all the colors within the picture? Look at the actions. Are they static? Are people moving or are they inferred? Do you feel that there's movement? I feel that there's movement in this picture from this little girl all the way to where they're fighting this blaze. What about this picture? This was from um, a tsunami floods um, in India. And then you see the woman lying on their prostrate. You see another hand on the left. And is there movement in this? Okay, I can see movement from her fingers going out like it's reaching out to that person. How would you discuss this? You'd have to talk about the, you'd have to talk about facial expression, gaze, proxemics, color, garment, um, all those things that need to be looked at, the shoe line to the top right. Um, what is it, what is the message coming through? 
What about this? There's also an end of um, devastation. It was also um, a tornado. He actually went and rescued his sister. They lost everything. What are we seeing? This we've seen actually someone who looks very happy, that smile on his face. We see that there's no distance between him and his sister. There's this lovely closeness about them. And although they're in the background, there's all this devastation, you can still see they have overcome and they are happy within this. How would you describe this? Again, KZN, um, the foreground, the center, the background. We're looking into the scully where the water flowed through. We see the road breaking up. And there is a sense of movement moving towards those people from this devastation here. This is in Australia. It's also another way of looking at the at flooding. Um, and they've had quite a few as well. He has a father and his son, and there's the car. Also a sense of movement going towards the vehicle. Another one from Durban with the, the flooding, the, 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 the houses that have been impacted, people, what they're doing, also the sense of movement. If you take it from the foreground and you move to the houses up the hill, there's a whole story that you could actually tell about this. So general terms to analyze visuals are also things like vectors and lines. Okay, what is that? Um, the little lines on cartoons and pictures which show some kind of movement. They can be straight, they can be curved, intersecting vertical, horizontal, and it is a focal point. So if you look at this little doggy movement, all these little lines by the paws, the head, the leash, the tail shows movement. So if you put these little lines on, these vectors and lines shows movement, something is happening. So you need that term to talk about this dog and that movement. What about the, the focal point of all these lines? They, they forming, they join you into that focal point in the center. There's also lines within pictures that will move you to the end. So if you at this, this pier moving out towards C, you're drawn in there. The, the lines are taking you inside. These, this prison wall, the, this fence is also drawing you in. There's also a line there which is drawing you in. There's also different angles. If you look at pictures, and this will also come up with film, film study in week nine, the high angle, the low angle, and the level. So if you're looking at a high angle, when the camera's held as normally showing someone who's been venerated, very important. If it's a low angle looking down, it means there's danger happening. If it's on the level, you're on the same level as the person. There's some equal um, relationship with you and the person. The camera, the far shot is showing something from a distance. The medium shot, you, you're on the same level. The close shot is taking you very intimately close to the person. So if you have a look at this, you're actually looking down at this person. So that means he's been threatened. It looks like a graveyard. Um, it's like a medium shot because you're quite there. So you're actually looking at him and you're quite close. So maybe you're sharing this experience with him. Maybe it's someone who has passed away. It's a funeral and he's lying on the coffin in this very bleak graveyard. So it's quite a scary or very sad shot. Um, what is your perspective as the viewer? Are you looking down at him? Are you looking up at him? Are you on the same level as him? I think if you can slightly down at him, for me, that's what it looks like. And that means it may be some kind of trauma that's happened in his life. Okay. Right, here's another one. Um, use of gestures. He doesn't have anything on his hand there, but he's doing this. And you all know that that gesture means what is the time and what does his face say? He's shocked that it's the time, okay? Because you must be able to describe shocked, meaning big eyes, mouth wide open, and that is his gesture to show he's looking at the time. So there are different symbols that we need to look at. And if you have a look at this, um, there's the moon, there's the fire, there's the, the, the skull and crossbones, there's the peace sign, the dove, the sun flag, all in our heads, all those symbols. And there are also just general common symbols that we know are around the heart symbol for love, the dove symbol for peace, the raven symbol for death, the tree symbol for life, the owl symbol for wisdom, the peace sign you've got the fire is danger, cross, um, skull and crossbones are the also for danger, moon is also going to be for feminism, they say the waning of the moon, the waxing of the moon, a flag is often for surrender or for peace. And um, sun is often for life um, and growth and warmth. All those things have all got meaning that come up with them. I've put a little um, link here where you can go and have a look. There's 40 um, symbols and what they mean if you want to go and check them out. So the first type, we can look at the various types, is symbols. A symbol is a sign or an image to represent something else. So if I put the dove there, it means I'm representing peace. If I put a tree there, it means I'm representing growth. All right. If I put an apple there, yes, on my iPhone, I'm representing iPhone, my iPad, my iPhone. 
also the things like Coca-Cola, the, the, um, the Starbucks, Samsung, Unilever, MasterCard, these are all different signs. And when you see them, the MasterCard sign, you know, oh, my, that's a bank is close by, or there's these, the switch for um, Nike, um, let's just do it. Those are things that tell you that that is what it's all about. Yes, there we go. You all know that's danger. Um, you know, all that means that's where the ladies must go for a bathroom. So how clear is the message from the symbol? Can you work it out? Who is the target audience? Can they understand what this picture is all about? If I was in China and I saw this, would I understand it? Okay, so it's important that I understand. That's why the Apple is so important. You can go anywhere in the world and you'll know that that is the Apple shop. Okay. <clears throat> this is the photograph. Um, it's an image that's recorded by a camera. All of you take selfies all the time, so you know all about pictures. This is of Nelson Mandela, obviously at Robben Island, looking out the window, maybe thinking about his life, maybe reflecting on what his experience was. So it's 27 years. Um, so if you're going to think about the context, as I said, it's black and white picture. It was taken on Robben Island. Um, what about, is it portrait or is it landscape? It's slightly landscape. Um, is it four back or middle ground? I think it's four leading out. I can actually see some movement in it. What is the main point? The main point, I think, is Mandela's face, but he's looking away from me. He's looking out the window or out the bar. So I know that he's reflecting on that. Um, is it a very stable or dynamic? I think it's quite dynamic because I think there's movement in it. I can see he's pensive with his um, expression and his body language. His hand is there, it's hanging down there. The other hand is down and he's looking wistfully outside his mouth is closed. It's, it's not a very happy, but it's not a very sad face either. The angle, I think, is, is a medium shot on the same level, so I'm with him there. The mood is light and dark, and how does it make you feel? It makes me feel sad as well when I think about what he went through, but it also gives me a bit of happiness to know what he's done for our country. And so it's Sandra Bang did. I used the same picture of someone else staring out the window. And she's saying, I've got no control over anything in my life. How am I going to control? She said, oh, I can't control my son. I can't control this. I can control that. But I can't control what happens to me when I, when I turn 65. And Sandra Bang, of course, says, we are there for help you. So we can sort that out. You can do all those things as a woman, but we can sort out everything for you when you turn 65. We are here for you. Same as Mandela was here for us, Santa Bank is there for her. So see how they get their messages across. There we go again, here's another picture. Again, Winnie and Mandela are looking towards the left. Their hands are raised to show um, they are in solidarity. They are, in, in, they are so happy that this 1994, he's been released from prison. That's gonna whole change of our whole country. And yes, interesting here yeah, is with um, Francois Pinar, 1995. Um, winning the World Cup in rugby, and there they are, shaking hands, hands on his shoulder, and the focal point is the World Cup there. Okay, we did run it again in 2019, I think it was, um, but those are sort of iconic pictures of this kind of relationship, the eye contact, the closeness, um, the smile, the happiness, and the focal point as well. Advertisements, yes, this is for... Um, our uh, SPs, you're going to have to do an advertisement. What do you do if you want to put the genre elements of an advertisement? Um, advertisement is a public notice promoting a product, service, opportunity, or cause. It could be any of those to promote you to do something about it. And it has different appeals. It appeals to our desires to be beautiful, to help, to be sympathetic, our needs, and our values. Um, and these might be a health, getting our vaccinations, enjoyment, things we like doing, relaxing. Luxury, those cars, phones, beauty, products, um, cosmetics, and success um, achievement. Um, and this is obviously with the Nike and especially and it says move more, move better. Um, the whole power and success that you get with Nike. What about having friends, enjoying going hikes? If I drink Mountain Dew, I can overcome and I can achieve so much. I can be victorious. If I drink Coke, I can have lots of friends and family because I'm going to share my Coke with you. And I've even got your name there. So the whole idea, I can bond and I can have family and I can be together if I just drink that Coke. See the message that can go through sublimely. If I've got money to burn, I can get this vehicle as well. Um, but the good sense not to, um, then you buy this vehicle. It shows what you can do if you've got money. If I use Gucci perfume, I'm going to be beautiful. I'm stunning like this woman. This is all the lure, the beauty that it's selling me. 
Yes, and if I use this toothpaste, I'll have a fresh mouth for 24 hours. Um, I won't have any plaque um, and how much I'll benefit from that health wise. Okay, so this is the whole idea that we have when we use a product and this is how to get us to buy it. So we go look at the language of advertisements too. So in your um, when you discuss this in your, uh, your workshop, you need to think about headline language, the slogans that are in there, like for instance, Nike, just do it. Are there any logos like the logo swish? Uh, what about fonts, color and contrast? There we are, just do it, the Nike for Nike. What about the language they use? And these are a whole lot of things from caps as well, from manipulative language to repetitions, to puns, to alliteration to exclamation marks, to using celebrities, half-truths, saying some, most, all. So there's a whole list of things that the kind of language you need to interpret um, advertisements. Okay, the 100%, okay, I, this is what Colgate does. It does all the protection for us. 80% of the bacteria is not on the teeth. It's in your whole mouth, and I must get rid of this. So this will encourage me to go and buy the product because it does my teeth, cheeks, Tongue and gums is going to protect me totally. So I have to make use of this product. Yes, and if I go and get my McDonald's, I'm going to be able to fuel up as well at the same time, and I'm going to be able to feel good. There's the Coke, there's the burger, there's the chips. So it's all we need to do is go to McDonald's and we've got fuel and we're going to feel good. That's how easy it is. Is what about Nando's? Turns out finger licking isn't good. Rather reach for the soap. This was when COVID came out, the need to sanitize. Interestingly, um, this is an ad for men by L'Oreal. Um, it's a whole ad to say that we need more women in the workplace. And I think women are depicted by lipstick. I don't know if that is such a truthful picture of us. And I quite like this one. So these are ads from 20 for 2022. Life is easier on iPhone. Okay, I agree. And that starts as soon as you turn it on. So if you want an easier life, I suggest you get your iPhone quickly. So this is how we actually analyze um, an advertisement. First of all, you go look at how do we use the AIDA principle. Okay, so the aid is attract the viewer and you do this by looking at the headline and the images in the advertisement. The I is what is the interest that is going to be arising? This is when we look at different needs within us. I need for beauty, I need for health, I need for luxury, I need for ease. Those are the needs we look at. And we go look at Maslow's um, hierarchy of needs, his pyramid, and we go right from the bottom that these are the kind of needs we have with interest, our psychological needs, um, which are our things for, I need for, for, for safety, for warmth, for food, for sleep. To our safety needs, um, sorry, that's not safety, it's food, air, water, sleep, clothing, and shelter. Safety needs are things like to be protected from anything that's going to happen to us, to have employment, to have health, to have property, um, resources, those are important things. Our third need is to be loved and to belong. So we need to have friends and family and people that, that like us, that intimacy, friendships, um, that we have got a connection. So if you've got no one in your class, you often can't do very well because you need to have friends. Esteem, that means that people are going to recognize us and praise us. We need to, that is a need for success and people to respect us. And only according to Maslow, if you've got all of those things, can we actually self-actualize? So if you're suffering because someone's breaking into your house, you don't have food, you're never going to self-actualize because you need all those needs to be met. And I'm going to add two more to that. We can't self-actualize without Wi-Fi and battery life. And that is why our outages at the moment so um, impact on our, on our sense of need and value because if we don't have battery life, how are we going to self-actualize and fulfill ourselves? Okay. Okay, going to the D now is the desire that's created and what are the benefits of having an iPhone? Okay, because it's easy, I can link up, I can get access to my Wi-Fi, all the benefits and maybe the cost isn't that bad. And the final thing is action. That's the A part. You've got to go and buy the product. So if you've achieved the A, I, D, and A of a product, a person goes and purchases that iPhone, it's achieved the whole thing. Um, you know where to buy it, you know how to access the, the, the product, and you will actually uh, go out and buy it. So if you think about this, if you're looking at this, this advertisement, 
what is the picture? What is the headline? It says, I am perfected. I'm being made perfect. What is the desire or the need? I desire to be beautiful, to be loved, to, to look gorgeous. What are the benefits that this product is going to do it all for me? I don't even have to do it. That's how easy it is. I just have to put this foundation on and I'm going to be perfect. And the action is when I go to the shop and I actually buy that color correcting cream. Okay, so I can look like this girl. This is also for men, not only girls that are worried about looking beautiful. In the first one on the left, he says, this is an anti-fatigue moisturizer so that you don't have to look tired anymore, men. You can have an anti-fatigue moisturizer. The one at the bottom right says, um, Vitalift 5. And that's not a facelift, it does the facelift for you. And in the top right there, New Hydro Energetic, the extreme range is going to make you hyper energetic just by using this product. So can you see how... We are buying this product become because L'Oreal can get us to buy it just because you want to look like that person. We don't look tired. We want to look like we've had a facelift and we want to have energy. All right. Look sharp, not tired, enough said. One is sold every minute. So we want to be like the other people buying the product. Cartoons for the FETs. A cartoon is a drawing or a picture often with text designed to entertain and amuse. All right. We've got to know about the different vocabs. We've got to know about speech bubbles and thought bubbles. And you have to be able to use those words when you're describing the cartoon. Think about caricatures and stereotypes. There is Trump as a caricature. There's Mr. Bean, what he looks like. And stereotypes. How do they make Muslims look? How do they make Mexicans look? How do they make girls look? How do they make workers look? How do they make gentlemen look? So those are stereotypes that we can use also in a cartoon. And you've got the frame sequence, you've got to be able to refer to the frames, and you've got to know how humor is created through satire, through irony, and through parody. You've got to know what those terms are. Satire is saying something in a very cutting way. Um, irony is saying something in the opposite way. Parody is when you're playing on something else, happening on something, somebody else. Um, Zapiro uses a lot of parody um, on vaccinations, on our corruption in our country as well. Yes, again, um, John and Garfield again, you can see there are three frames, you can see there's a thought bubble, you can see there's a voice bubble, you can see where they're looking with their gazes, um, you can see that little, little vectors showing the, um, the movement of um, Garfield's head, um, they're all looking at one way and it's about his, the, the rats have got hold of his energy drinks, and they've been doing jumping jacks in the kitchen, okay, from all that. And then he says sardonically at the end, I think you solved the mystery Sherlock. So you take them through all of those and you need to describe what that humor is all about. How do you study cartoons? You've got to look at those caricatures, facial expressions, all the things I've mentioned already, body language, kinesics, proxemics, gaze, relationships. Look at also again the setting, the background, where and when did this take place? What kind of language and punctuation has been used? Remember I spoke about the bold, the exclamation marks, the jargons, single words, um, the bold, the capital, the use of exclamation marks. And here you can see, if you look at these four frames, we've got Lucy and Charlie, and um, you can see the three of them are sitting together, look at their body language, look at their social distancing, look at who's speaking, look at the facial expressions. Um, well, frame one, well, what are you doing here? He's saying to Charlie, and Charlie's just standing there, and you can see they look angry and irritated with him. And they both start shouting at him. And you can see his face is turning around like this. Go home. We don't want you around you. Who asked you to come by in the first place? Nobody. Go home. Okay. Shouting at him. All the exclamations, the dark words. And there you see he just looks dejected with a little smoke ring above his head. And he walks away looking very sad. And they're looking after him. And then they say, you know, it's a strange thing about Charlie Brown. You almost never see him laugh. Okay. And you feel so sorry for him because they're such horrible friends to have that shout at you like that. Here's another thing, Lucy obviously shouting again. Why should I have to live in a world somebody else has messed up? I'll give them 12 years to get everything in order. And the hands up, she's gesturing to speak about the body language, to speak about the nonverbal, to speak about the gesture, to speak about the vocalics. You need to bring all that into talking about cartoons. Here's Nancy. Um, there she's at school. There are four frames here. She's busy working on a school computer. She's, I wish I wasn't stuck at school. I wish I was at home. I uh, just think of all the fun I could be having at home. And then she thinks about what she's doing at home. And she's also on a computer in third frame. 
And she says, that's the life. Okay, what is, what's funny about that? Um, why would you laugh about that? Okay. So active viewing analysis is that you've got to look at all these visual choices and then you've got to construct a message right from the framing to the shot, to the angle, to the facial expression. I'm repeating all of this again, the gaze, the eye contact, the body language, the color, the lighting, the image, the clothing. What is the relationship between the viewer and the subject? Um, how do the words contribute to the message? What is the emotive language that's been used? Is it literal? Is it figurative? Is it fact or opinion? Is there repetition? And I'm also suggesting you go and look at Ferreira on page 226 to 227, table 14.1. She's got a whole table where she looks at shots and angles and gives you a lot of detail of what you can get when you look at different visuals. So go and check that out if you want to use it as well when you're looking at the geometric elements for your um for your assignment three. This is taken from a, um, a first additional language, um, second paper one. It's the visual part and it's, it's all about um, the secret to a kind of fresher home is, is flash supreme and there's different kinds. And they're saying who's the target audience? Why, has the, why have they included four bottles of plush supreme cream? And there's lavender, there's pot puree, there's spring and there's lemon, okay. Must be for all the women out there doing all the cleaning up. Um, and these are other questions that they also asked. So you actually have to be able to interpret different things if you're going to look at an advertisement. Um, how can you really get more information about the advertised product? And then to go and look at the advert, how are you going to get that inf information? And then in your view, is a visual of the lady effective in conveying the message of the advertisement? Substantiate your answer. So go to go and look at her face what she's doing, and would you say this is a very good way to advertise this product? Think about it. I'm sure they would accept all answers. Okay, that's my last slide, and that was visual literacy. Um, we're still going to get on to other things, so why do we need to be visual in our thinking? What's next? It's going to be film study, and I'm going to pick up a lot of what I've said now um, in visual literacy when I look at film study, because a lot of the imagery and the way we interpret things are exactly the same as the film studies. So it's a long message. Um, I'm going to put together an overview for, um, for our assignment three, um, so you can see the genre elements that you must use and how you teach um, those, those, those elements that I've asked you to look at. Um, thinking about communicative teaching as well when you're actually putting those um, activities together. So have a good evening. It's Sunday night. Um, get those last um, online trackers in if you haven't done that already. And those of you who are submitting your assignment to SOAs, get those in as well before midnight. Okay, take care and I'll chat to you during the week. Bye. Let me see in this.